say in terms of passengers carried. Delta is the world's largest airline, and Chris spent a lot of time with us yesterday with very useful information on what we need to do as destinations and as airports on how to attract new traffic. Finally today, oh, and then in the afternoon, how can I forget that, because it had to be one of the most useful sessions for me. We were treated to three separate seminars on best practices. If we wanted to go back and implement any of those, we have been told absolutely the best practice on how to do that. Today at day three, now we're going to step back and we're going to have some case studies that actually show you how you take all that information we had in day one and in day two and we put it together and actually apply it in our homes. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to pull it down a little bit in scope or size. I think all of us will kind of go, none of us have to run Hartsville Atlanta Airport. <laughs> the airports that we are talking about, the countries, the destinations that are served, that we all work for and with, are much smaller. So we today will have case studies, starting with mine in the Caribbean island, and then moving to the United States, where we look at the applications of all of the different principles. Now I want to say one thing, especially in my case, I do not hold out what happened and what was done, the strategies implemented in these islands, as best practices. What I'm going to present today is the situation, the strategy that government came up with, and the results of that strategy. Then we will leave it to you to decide is there anything that is useful or applicable to your airport or your destination or whether you think that particular strategy worked, and if you decide it didn't, then you know what not to do. Now, for 20-some years, I've had the absolute pleasure of working in the Caribbean. And as all my colleagues are here from the Caribbean will tell you, it's a very special part of the world. And so I want to give you all a vibe, and get everyone in the mood. It's Friday, it's the last day, we're going home, but we're talking the Caribbean. We ought to be barefoot and have sand around us, but since this is such a beautiful facility. We will keep our shoes on and we will not have sand. So, knowing that there were rum lovers among us, I thought, aha, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to serve rum punch. That's going to get everybody in the mood. And I thought, okay, it's not the moon yet. Nowhere in the world I can't serve rum punch. So I said, I'm going to do the next best thing. I'm going to treat you all to about a minute of what is arguably the second most important export from the Caribbean, and that is its reggae music. Yeah. So if you are ready, and if the technology gods are with me, <laughs> we will. Oh, and the technology gods don't. Angelica is a woman. Especially those of you who know the Caribbean, but it may be applicable 
to your own destination. That what you have just seen is Madison Avenue's idealized version of the Caribbean. Blue skies, white sand, green palms, turquoise waters, and yes, bluebirds. But it's not all like that. This is what we present to the tourists. But behind that, we find developing economies. Some of our 32 Caribbean nations have actually been registered, called third world countries. So you begin to understand the vital necessity that air transport is and why it is so vital to the Caribbean. So my premise is bluebirds, nice to have. Silver birds, the ones with the two wings and the big engines that come and bring tourists, we need to have it. And that is what we want to talk about today, how we do it and what we can do. It was established on the first day by Craig Lesser that to the world economy, tourism represents 9% of the GDP. Many people don't realize that, but to the economies of the Caribbean, tourism represents 17.5%. And if you were to take out those few islands, one of which is represented here, that have an economy driven by oil or by the banking sector, you would find that for the remaining Caribbean islands, tourism represents 35 to 45% of the GDP. So let's look at the Caribbean. It's 32 different islands, but what is the main environment as we talk about tourism and as we talk about air life? Well, I happen to love, just as a speaker and as a writer, an alliteration. And Ferris beans and guarantees all kind of rolls off the tongue very easily. But when you break it down, that's exactly what the story is in the Caribbean. Chris Kennedy told us yesterday, other speakers from the airport, Jason told us on the first day and reminded us that airlines are in business to make money for their stockholders. So when you look at an airline and you look at an airplane, it is an asset. It is a multi-million dollar asset. And you are asking that airline to commit that asset to service of your destination. They've only got three ways to come up with revenue for that asset. The fare they can charge, the fees they can charge, and we're not talking about the taxes now. We're not talking about everything that government and tourism and everybody else decides to you know, turn the airlift into a cash cap. Not the sell. But the fee to check your bag, the fee to sit in the economy comfort seat, the fees, and then the guarantees. Everyone kind of danced around on the first day, I felt. The, the, the issue of guarantees. I was very happy to see Chris Kennedy just simply say, yes, there are some cases where the traffic doesn't want, where the traffic is thin, when we're in the startup market, you are going to have to put a minimum revenue guarantee. What you are doing is guaranteeing a minimum revenue for that flight. Because think about it. Government could give that flight to the island of the Bonaire. And Bonaire, a leisure destination, the vast majority of the Caribbean the business is leisure. So that's going to fill up the back of the airplane. But you have very little traffic in the front of the airplane. Yes, people cash in their frequent flyer miles, but that doesn't they bring any revenue to that asset. People like Chris Kennedy are going, okay, I can fly that airplane to Bonaire and fill up the back with leisure traffic at XYZ Fair. Or I can fly that airplane to London, or to Brazil, or to China, and fill up the front part of the airplane with business class and first class traffic. So the revenue on board that aircraft is always going to be higher by the very nature that you don't haul over a major business center to get to the Caribbean. So that's the math and the why behind the guarantee. It's the matter of onboard revenue. And the one reason and the one thing that we are hampered with in the Caribbean, that you can't think of any other region in the world where you would go on vacation 
the, the airplane doesn't pass through a major business center. So our revenue, the airplanes, they have to get it from a minimum revenue guarantee. 32 beautiful sun-rich islands. I call them the haves and the have-nots. And I know this is a term that's usually associated with wealth, and in this case it is wealth, but it is the wealth of having an international airport. Those are my haves. If you have an international airport, there's a chance you're going to have international non-stop service. Those are my haves. The have-nots are those islands, those destinations that do not have an international airport. Or maybe they have an international airport, but they have no international non-stop service. And you know, our vacationer, our travelers become very spoiled. They want to connect. Too much can happen if you're connecting everything, you're losing your luggage, missing your connection, or having a flight canceled. Everybody wants non-stop now. It's a real premium. The airlines have figured that out. You pay more revenue to go non-stop. But in most cases, it's worth it to us. Okay, this, and I apologize in advance, there is a lot of type on this slide. But have and have not, we need to break it down even smaller. These guys, they're the have it all, so I'm kind of not even going to talk about it. They've got an international airport. They have a large enough inbound tourism base to stimulate demand. We're talking about Aruba. We're talking about the leisure airports, Montego Bay and Jamaica. We're talking about Barbados. There's really very little need to finance airlift, and they have nonstop airlift. So those not only are my haves, those are my, they have it all. I'm not going to talk about it. There's other people who have some. They have an international airport, but they have a small tourism base. When you're dealing with 50 or 60,000 visitors every year, that size of the tourism base makes what the airlines call very thin traffic on the route. So there's not that much demand. And so then you come down to the third, and I think critical, and I say government, but you can say government, you can say airport, you can say tourist board. Someone has to be willing to finance airlift. I personally feel that governments of the Caribbean are finally coming around to the fact that airlift as an essential service. Government must provide schools, roads, defense, protection for its citizens, and frankly, in the Caribbean, an essential service, they must support airlift. And you'll find that most governments begrudgingly have come down to that. If you have someone willing to finance it, you can get your nonstop airlift. Now I'm my above the line and below the lines, like the New York Times, above the fold and below the fold. Okay, now we're below the fold. We're in the have a little and have nots. Okay, international airport, small tourism base, government philosophically unwilling, or in some cases unable to finance airlift, but usually it's a matter of political will. They simply don't choose to for a variety of reasons. But I can pretty much tell you, they're also, they don't have any non-stop airlift. And then the have-nots, and in this day and age, we still run into them. No international <coughs> airport small tourism base, government unable or unwilling, and they have no non-stop airlift either. And I think if nothing else, this slide ought to make you people from the airports feel pretty important. Because you are having an airport that works well and functional and serves your community is indeed the key to the economic development of your people. Okay, as I said, I'm not presenting these case studies. I only have three, and I do watch my time, because I can sit here and talk about the Caribbean all day long. And then we put the music back on and we dance. <laughs> um, these are not presented to you as best practices. These are real-life case studies, real-life situations, where real-life elected governments made decisions, spent money or did not spend money, and then I have the results. And this is where then you will make the judgment if any of these tactics that these governments employed make sense for you to take home, to think about, or just simply reject out of hand. If anyone knows where, or doesn't know where Bonaire is, let me help you out. 
right down here. Bonaire is the B in the ABC Islands of Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao. I know I had worked in the Caribbean 10 years when the government first approached me, and I remember taking the phone call because I was at an airport going somewhere. And um, my assistant said, and you know, someone from Bonaire wants to talk to you on the phone. And I went, Bonaire? Bon where? <laughs> I had been in the Caribbean 10 years, and I had no idea where it was. One of the things that's very important also, just not only part of your education, it's going to impact on the solutions that they are putting in place right now is please look at their proximity to South America and their proximity to the rest of the Caribbean arc. Okay, as I said, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao. A curse and a blessing. Everyone's heard of where they are now as long as you say, oh, you know, we're down there with Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao. It's exactly what the airline said. Yeah, we know. We serve Aruba and Curacao. Take a fare. No. These are very rough waters. There's no such thing as take a ferry. Bonaire is the easternmost island. So it became a real challenge. And their endeavor to attract airlift started in 1998. Before that, Bonaire developed as a tourism destination in the 1960s. Bonaire is a scuba diving mecca. And that is one of the reasons that two of the tactics employed by the Bonaire government will work. Because scuba divers, if you know them, my man from Cayman probably knows scuba divers. They will dive, dive, dive no matter what. In the recession, the kids went without shoes. They were not going without a diving vacation. In the season, Bonaire luckily is outside the hurricane belt. Divers dive year round. You want to you want to attract a niche market segment that will help you level out your peaks and valleys of your tourism season. Go after the scuba divers because it's it's a lifestyle. It is an obsession. And because of that, the government was able to leverage two things that not every destination will be able to leverage. A little bit real quickly. Their municipality of Holland. Many of you have heard of the Netherlands Antilles. Um, I don't think we have anyone here from St. Martin or Curacao. Um, the Netherlands Antilles were dissolved in 2009. In October 10, 2010, Bonaire voted and became part of Holland. Um, many of the islands in the former Netherlands Antilles chose to become independent. Bonaire simply was too small. Save and Eustatia as well were simply too small to become independent. They could not, the government could not provide basic services for the population without. So they voted to become part of Holland. They are considered a municipality of Holland, much like a Puerto Rico or to become a state. Population, 15,000, and quite frankly, that's pushing it. We've put 15,000 because usually I qualify it by saying, and that's flamingos. There's actually just 13,000 people. Um, but what is amazing is one of the islands with the smallest population and the smallest tourism base has one of the finest airports in the Caribbean and frankly, one of the largest. And it didn't take losing a war to the United States to get the runway built, <laughs> as it did in Grenada. <laughs> but they have two runways of 9,400 feet and 7,400 feet. It's a 24-7 airport operation. How many of the airports have curfews? I know most islands do, and if someone wants to come in with a private jet afterwards, or if there's a jet that's been delayed somewhere, it's a whole matter of, OK, K man, or it's extra charges, and it's where do I get someone to you know, run the tower, bring them in, and you know, get their bags off the airplane. Little teeny bone hair has a 24-7 operation. And that's on the base of 71,000 tourists and arrivals. How do they do it? Oh, I put this in for the airport geeks. I am not an airport person. I'm a tourism person. There is a blending, though. And everyone has been talking over the past two days about the shared opportunities. We have to go in with your tourism folks, your tourist board, your minister of tourism. In fact, in the Caribbean right now, most ministers of tourism, their portfolio is tourism and civil aviation because they're going to make us talk to each other whether we choose to or not. So I put that in just to prove that I respect and understand what you do, and I'm going to leave it to the experts from there. I couldn't have told you what a Torah was unless it was a Torah, Torah, Torah from the movie. All right.
writing. Okay, four strategies. Number one, obtain new development funding. In the case of Bonaire, it came from the holding company that owns the airport. It did not come from the government, did not come from the general fund, did not come as in our case in Mexico yesterday from the tourist board. Strategy number two, with the vast majority of the scuba divers being Americans, and when I say the vast majority, 88%, it is a totally homogenous market, 88% of the people who come to Bonaire are scuba divers. That means I don't have to worry about the weddings market, I don't have to worry about honeymoons, I don't have to worry about the golf market, I don't have to chase anything but scuba divers, but they bring their own problems. But because they are American, and the fact that Bonaire had no service from an American carrier, the first and foremost objective of government was to attract an American carrier and then build out from there. Even though they're Dutch, they went after an American carrier. In this case, they went after American Eagle, um, even though it's not mainline American. And many of us think, you know, well, Eagle's just a regional carrier, frankly. Um, it was an American carrier, and Bonaire had never had service from an American carrier. It was a two-year process to get American Eagle to come in to Bonaire. But after a two-year process, and that process, for someone asked, one of the two days, was actually led by the head of government. And so the head of government, and then they brought on tourism people and airport people. <coughs> Strategy number three, which we learned, I don't remember if it was from George, is it from your presentation, or Kevin. Strategy number three, utilize all clothes and making their spa appointments and having lunch and then getting the umbrella drink and going to the beach. No, they want to get them, they get in the water. We run red eyes into Bonaire. That allowed us to go to an airline and say, that airline is sleeping at Atlanta Hartsville. We learned yesterday, if the airline's sleeping, the airplane is sleeping, the airplane isn't making money. So if I want you to fly that all night long, and then return noon the next day, I'm increasing, Mr. Airline, I'm increasing your utilization. Now this doesn't necessarily work in other markets because Delta tried it in Grenada. Grenada is about 10 to 15% scuba divers, not enough. And it just didn't fly. <laughs> Most people would prefer a daytime rotation. But if by knowing, and everyone who has stood up in front of us has said, you have to know your market. If by knowing your market, you feel that enough people would put up with a red eye, you cut your cost, and you cut the minimum revenue guarantee in half because you're using an airplane that would have been sleeping at the time. Strategy number four, and this one I love and I thought when I was great until I found out that our colleagues from the Dominican Republic had beat us to it. As an independent nation, you are governed by air service agreements. And we've all talked, heard about the bilaterals and the open skies agreement. And the U.S. and Holland have the most liberal of all open skies agreements. So you notice from the map that Bonaire, the proximity to South America, all of us right now are looking to Brazil and all of the South American emerging markets as we need to get some of that money. We need to attract some of those people. Now, how do we get them here? Well, because of the less liberal air agreements of some of these emerging nations, they can't fly as frequently to the U.S. as they would like to, nor can they fly to as many cities in the U.S. as they would like to. But by using Bonaire freedom rights, they can fly to Bonaire, then they can fly to Chicago, then they can fly back to Brazil. I'm sorry, they would originate in South America. But Senate freedom is about the highest right, because the eighth freedom, as all of you know, is cabotage. But this would be, and we thought, all righty, we're going to make Bonaire a Southern Caribbean hub for those airlines. We talked to Gaul, we talked to TAM for those airlines wishing to increase their penetration to the secondary U.S. market cities. And we, we thought we really had it. We did it at routes. Everyone said, attend routes. 
We had these discussion at routes, as I said, only to find out that the Dominican Republic had beat us to it. Is anyone, from, where's my colleague from the DR? Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> Actually, my congratulations, and I hope it works because I think it's a magnificent precedent. Alrighty. So, very quickly, this was Bonaire's history. We started with American Eagle, then we ended up with Continental United, and um, Continental United out of Newark, Houston, and then finally Delta out of Atlanta. Delta runs a daytime service, but Newark and Houston come in as red eyes. And many people think, and I've talked to Delta about it, and I've talked to Chris about it, and it's something as simple as Atlanta is one hour closer to Bonaire than either flying time from Newark or flying time from Houston. That would put the red eye in 3.30 or 4 in the morning. That doesn't even work with scuba divers. Because of the extra hours flying time, you get in 5 or 5.30, you get your bags, you get to the hotel at 6 or 6.30, many people are getting up then anyway. You can have breakfast and all of the hotels, for those of you who come from the hotel side, all the hotels have found a way to get the rooms open and have at least changing rooms and one or two hospitality rooms, even if the rooms aren't ready. Post-2008 um, wasn't so much in this case the economic crisis, but it was American Airlines' decision to close the hub in San Juan. That daily, and daily at 64 seats times seven, somebody better than I do the math, is quite a hit to take. But American Airlines pulled out. And post-2008, with all of the airline consolidation and with the higher loads and with the higher fuel cost, remember in pre-2008 we were $80 or $40 a barrel. And it hasn't seen that. What happened was American Eagle dropped out and that capacity simply has not been replaced because airlines are not adding services. Delta will engage. People will put two and three flights on during peak season, but additional service is very hard to add in this environment. Insular is a small regional carrier that penetrated the Miami market, but the other thing that all of you know, we talked a little bit about the importance of being able to run in nonstop, is that the LCC and the regional carriers, there is no connectivity. And so if you tell someone who's coming from Chicago or from Moline or Portland, Oregon, they have to fly to Miami, check your bag, run around outside, recheck it in. Oh, by the way, go through security again and don't miss your connection. It really doesn't work all that well. So that caused Bonaire to have to implement strategy number five which is the least desirable of the strategies that some of the small lines you have no other option but to do so, and that is connections over international hubs. And so yes, our sister islands of Aruba and Curacao that have a plethora, a wealth of air service, our passengers come in on them. Because the next case study really examines what happens when you have to do an international hub, I'm gonna move on past this. So that was it for Bonaire. That's what they did. They knew their market. They leveraged what they had. They had a strategy, and they had a government willing to finance airlift. Okay, I love this slide. This may remind some of you of home. For you airport people, this is probably your worst nightmare. This is Dominica. That runway is just 5,000 foot. That runway, as you can see, is nestled in between two of seven active vol of dormant volcanoes on the island. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and you can see the fog already starting to roll in, and frankly, this is a beautiful day. So you literally, a pilot has two options. Normally, um, the airplanes land west to east, which means they come down through the slot trying desperately not to clip a wind tip on either side of the volcano. <laughs> you get over the airfield, you just cut the engines and slam down, because heaven forbid, if you skid or your roll is too long, you're in the Caribbean. 
And there's other ways to get into the Caribbean without having your airplane take you there. <laughs> so this is what I call the perfect example of my half knots. Okay, this is where Dominica is. Important that you should pick up is the proximity to the to St. Lucia. Because they are the uh, island that is going to have to employ a strategy totally based on attracting passengers over a nearby international hub. Okay, there's better than St. Lucia and Barbados. Okay, 70,000 people, 5,200 foot runway, 78,000 inbound arrival, and two local airports. And the one you saw was the big one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for everyone who thinks they've got a problem, or, oh, I know, we do airport managers that think you'd like a challenge. <laughs> They're constantly looking for good talent in Dominica. Okay, strategy number one is the absolute only strategy that was available to them. Build their capacity <coughs> through the acquisition of assets in partnership with an operator. Many of you have heard of Leah if you are from the Caribbean. I keep talking to the Caribbean people and I don't need to ignore our colleagues from Europe. I wish I were from Europe myself. <laughs> but um, the government reluctantly is in the airline business. The major regional carrier since American Eagle pulled out is a carrier called Liat. And it's owned by three and now four governments. But um, Dominica's investment is a very small one. And it's mainly a token investment that enables them a seat on the board so they can influence a little bit of policy. Their first strategy is if I'm paying to be part of this, I've got to optimize my investment. The other strategy they have, oh, one thing I didn't mention about that um, <clears throat> lovely runway, there's no lights for night landing. Yeah. And about four in the afternoon, <laughs> when the time changes, it gets dark and the, the cloud cover starts to come in. But they have a cargo carrier landed a 737-300 there once. And so now another strategy is, and for daytime landings it's certified, another strategy is, are there options that they are considering to find an operator and bring in their own 737, probably out of Miami or Fort Lauderdale. In the meantime, <laughs> they're building capacity through better routing over their international hubs. And now this is clever, because someone took the time to think about it, I'm sorry to say it wasn't me. They are leveraging the revenue agreements entered into by the islands on either side of them in order to get better concessions on their connecting times. They are going to St. Lucia. And they're saying to St. Lucia, okay, you've got American, you've got Delta, you've got United, you've got JetBlue, and you've got um, US Airways coming into Huonora, which is the major international airport. <coughs> so you have an MRG on some of those services. Well, if we were to route and market connecting over St. Lucia, and maybe 15 of those seats on your airplane are through passengers to Dominica, that would help you, government of St. Lucia, meet your revenue guarantee. Because the whole story about if you've got to connect, you have got to minimize the inconvenience to your passengers. Therefore, you've got to work with the airlines and you've got to work with the airports <coughs> on your minimum connecting times. You've got to work with how fast they can get to you through security, because sometimes you're running against um, the clock, how fast you get through TSA and back to immigration and then check out again, because you will have to check in. So they have to work very closely with their international airlines and with the international hubs to minimize that inconvenience. Most of these smaller airports um, don't have in-transit in, in lounges. So that, except with Aruba, Barbados, and a few other ones, it's really not an alternative. 
And so if you are in a position in your destination where you are dependent on connecting with a larger international carrier over a hub, then your job is not just a local job. It becomes a job that you also have to do in your connecting hub with the airports and the airlines. <coughs> strategy number three is they had to launch and follow the access marketing strategy because they couldn't get out there and market. Their sole message could not be come to Dominica. It had to be come to Dominica via St. Lucia. And rather than going to their E&D cards, and people were talking yesterday about what a wonderful database Barbados has. Rather than going to their own database of visitor arrivals, they again had to work with neighboring islands because they had to market to those people coming in via St. Martin and via Huonora Airport in St. Lucia. So again, it's this whole inter-island cooperation and all small nations have their borders and have their territories. And you know simply getting someone to tell you what their top markets are because you want to market to them too. You care less if they're going to flow over your airport. You're not about ready to give away your marketing list. But this really gets down to the fact then, and obviously they come from the tourism side, we have to be able to mine our databases. We really have to know our markets because we need to know where they live. Because a small destination can't afford to market to the entire United States and Canada. You have to be able to do gateway marketing. And you have to market to people where they live. You have to find where they are. You have to market to them there. And Dominica does a very, very effective job of all the small islands that we're looking at. They have the highest number of visitor arrivals. And they have no international airlift at all. This is in, um, Dominica's international airlift and what they were able to achieve. And as you can see on the top of the slide, Liat, 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 Liat. Inbound, this 50 passenger dash eights from the major hubs. This, I think, is interesting. I mean, I find it absolutely fascinating. When American Eagle popped out, Silver Airlines, Seaboard Airlines, a bunch of smaller airlines stepped in. But they didn't step in with 64 seat ATRs. They stepped in with SOBs. And it's a smaller capacity, I think these are 30, 35 passenger SOBs. But they thought, no problem, we're just going to plop them right in and we're going to fly the same schedules. No one took, no one thought, a SOB flies more slowly than an ATR flies. Therefore, they can't just put them in the connecting position because they're not going to get there in time. The mainline carrier will have left San Juan 10 minutes ago before the SOB lands. So that's what I meant when I say that the minute you have to work and are dependent over a connecting airport, then your job is not just local. Your job is you have to also work with that connecting hub with something as esoteric as how fast a SOB flies versus how fast a Dash 8 flies versus how fast an ATR-72 used to fly when Eagle was there. Then you see something that very few destinations, major service. St. Kitts and Nevis is a two-island federation in the north of the Caribbean arc. Um, St. Kitts, for the first 300 years, was total sugar. That was their economy. They are actually called Sugar City because they were the first Caribbean island settled by the Europeans. And they were the heart of the sugar industry from its founding in the Caribbean. Much of the tourism product evolves around sugar. So you have these lovely old <coughs> plantation inns that have been converted to hotels. You have scenery of the old sugar mills on a very verdant countryside. One volcano hasn't erupted recently, 
but a relatively undeveloped island from a tourism standpoint to as late as 2006. Now, when you think of little Dickie Bonaire started in 1960 attracting tourism, 2006 is a pretty late entry into the tourism arena. It has disadvantages. People's loyalty, they already had islands that were their favorite. By then, somebody else had established that. And I think it's Barbados, and Lila, Antigua, St. Martin, you know, any one of the other 32 islands or 31 islands. But the fact that they came in in 2006, after a long planning cycle, because government does not put workers who have worked in sugar their entire life out of work without a plan. Not if government wants to get reelected, they don't anyway. And so the, they had the luxury of a planning process and how we were going to take this economy that was driven by sugar and have it be driven by tourism. Okay? Think it's Nevis? N northern part of the Caribbean. And for them, flip side of that was we were the ugly redhead stepchild of Elliot Nevis, but at least we had an awareness out there. Population of 36,000. Again, I'm just saying that whether you are a country in Africa, in West Africa, whether you're in the Mideast, I'm trying to give you the idea that we're not dealing with Fulton County, we're not dealing with Atlanta or Hartsfield and Nashville. These are in your size. One runway. 7,600 feet. Inbound arrivals, 120,000. Small islands, small base, very small tourism infrastructure. Okay, strategy number one, obtain government support for route development funding. And I say this as strategy number one as I say this as a given. If your government is not used to considering air service and air transportation an essential service, this is easier said than done. I mean, I know every time I have to go before Parliament and I have to justify my budget. I remember once in Antigua, I had to go before the former Bird government. And says, Mrs. Kimmel, welcome back. Every year you come here and ask for money to take to the wealthy United States. You want me to send money overseas to your marketing firm, Mrs. Kamel. But, you know, I got me government. I got me schools to build. I got me roads to build. I got me people to protect. Why is it you want me to give my government funds to you? Okay, that was step number one, just getting marketing funds. Step number two, think of these same governments, all of them cash strapped. Remember, developing economies, when we suggest they sign a revenue agreement with a big, rich American or European airline, it's like, are you crazy? They could, you know, they make, you said it yesterday, they make more in a day than maybe the, what? Maybe the GDP of the country. So as much as I say strategy number one is do this and then I move right along, that is easier said than done and it, goes totally to the leadership, it goes to the top, it goes to the PM. Does he really believe that tourism is the economic driver? One of the issues in Dominica that we just saw, PM believes agriculture is the economic driver. I go, okay. That's up to him, he knows more about his country than I do. But it takes a full belief in the power of tourism to make life better for their people to give government the money to provide the basic services that the people need. Strategy number two, whereas Bonaire decided we want one, we want one American carrier, and then we'll build from there. St. Kitts goes, nope, I'm attacking all markets at once. I want Europe, I want Canada, I want the United States. 
It's a concerted effort, and we're going after all of them at once. So all of a sudden, people were deployed all over the source markets simultaneously to get this issue solved. Now, it's probably a pretty smart prime minister because, you know, after he had just closed the tourism industry, or just closed the sugar industry, and put all those people out of work, he may have figured, I've got to do this fast because I may not have another five years. We don't know how long I'm going to be able to last in this particular environment. Therefore, the strategy was just to get out there and get it done. And that takes phenomenal political will. Strategy number three was connections over the international hubs on intra-island carriers, but strategy number three he didn't want anything to do with it. He wanted non-stop airlift and then to tap in, and I think it started because of our proximity to Nevis, and we were able to look at the person per day spend in Nevis, see how high that was, and think, okay, if we could tap into that discerning, more sophisticated travel market, they're going to need their own private jets. So, oh, by the way, while we're out there giving money to all the international airlines, let's build a little jet terminal here. We're just going to increase the size of the apron right over here for VIP services. And that is exactly what they did. Simultaneously. And when you want to think of, well, when, you know, sometimes when one project gets done and starts to produce a little revenue, we use that revenue to pay for the next project. That's why I keep saying simultaneously. That talks to the will of government. But, why I like to say kids, this is a success story. This is how it's supposed to happen. And I can't even hold it up as best practices in the situation in which the island found itself after the closure of the sugar industry. This happened to work. From Eagle, three times a week, Miami, and one US Air, to all of this. Daily from Miami, twice a week from JFK, Delta comes in and I had many conversations with Chris on this trip about seeing what we can do to increase that Delta frequency. Oh yeah, I have no shame. Um, <laughs> I'm staying at her house and I'm still booking her about her. Right. I will say Delta 183. Um, during peak season, they will upgrade. And Delta, of all the carriers, has been the most responsive, maybe because they're the biggest, they've got the most airplanes to throw against it. If you can demonstrate demand, they are the first ones to be there to respond to demand, to upgauge the aircraft or throw another airplane against it, put another airplane against it. US Air, BA, twice a week, out of Gatwick and Air Canada seasonally, coming in out of Toronto. Just because this doesn't happen very often, I just want to emphasize what type of incremental lift the strategy represents. 2006 to 2013, after you've taken into consideration the engaging, the seasonalizations, cancellations, and all, about 199% increase in inbound arrivals and a tourism base that grew from 70,000 to last year's 100. <coughs> Government stayed in power. Okay. We all know that the industry we've chosen, the industry we all love, is a very dynamic industry and is constantly changing. Um, nowhere more so? Well, I can't even say nowhere more so. What I know is the Caribbean, so we're going to talk about the constant change going on in the Caribbean. All three of the destinations that I profiled lost airlift when American Eagle pulled out. And in today's environment of consolidations and everybody watching every penny, the fuel costs where they are, airlines are not quickly flowing back in. There are new carriers emerging. I know Silver is emerging and Seaboard is emerging, but they're emerging trying to fill that intra-island niche, connecting off international hubs. And they're coming in with SOPs, and they're coming in with dash aids. No one has come in with the new ATRs. No, yes, I stand corrected, Trinidad. I, keep me honest here. 
Um, Caribbean Airlines, they've got the new ATR they're flying in. Um, right now they're using it to Grenada and some of their other intra-island routes. Existing carriers are expanding their route structures and they are refleeting. One of the reasons that LIAT allowed another country to invest, not because they didn't have enough prime ministers trying to tell the CEO how to run an airline. No.
I am just going to look at you for my daily inspiration on beautiful fabric from West Africa. Caribbean women, they have shoes to kill the rest of us. <laughs> it has been my pleasure to be with you. And thank you so much. Mm-hmm. 
you have an example of countries? Dominica. Nikas. Dominica has no international air force. Airport. Okay, the lower right, which would have been this one. Right. Yeah, the poor, yeah. No international airport. Government unwilling to finance. No non-stop international airlift. Um, yeah, those are the things that go Dominica, Nevis doesn't have any St. Vincent the Grenadines. Now, they are in the process of building and opening an international mm -hmm. airport. But those are the three that I'm aware of, obviously, Save Us, Asia, some of the really small ones, fall into that category. Mm -hmm. And you all may be able to help me if you're aware of any others. I think, with, I think a Dominican Republic or San Juan is it's a better name or or Caribe uh, in Santo Domingo City. Uh, we have two international and interregional. Yeah. Is there a Peru or Caribe? Well, as I said, you're making strides to be the hub from South America. <coughs> so, yes, the hub may indeed shift. And talk about dynamic, it's going to be very interesting <coughs> to watch the Dominican Republic take over the position in the whole international and domestic air, airline scheme that was once held by San Juan. And it's all going to key on how many of the regional carriers up there. We have totally eight people in the I know you are. You have stepped up. I, I am not personally familiar with your government, but I have to credit someone with vision and amazing political will to make that happen. Because we have to talk about development, we have to talk about the airports, additional air service, we have that fifth runway. We all have the same problems, and maybe on a smaller scale. And so, you know, kudos. Because yes, you saw an opportunity and your government is taking it. So that was just a small commercial for our friends <laughs> in the Dominican Republic with all the credit because it's not easy. It's never an easy task. They're all goes back to government. And